I'll just show you this lovely book, Unseen Beings. Um, it's amazing, really, because in a lot of ways, I feel like we're really much on the same page <laughs> and saying very much the same kind of thing. And uh, even a lot of the times, you know, drawing on similar ideas, theories and perspectives. So I was amazed when uh, Dawn pointed this book out. So it's really great that we can have Eric here with us today to talk about it. So I, I'll just read you his little uh, bio here. Um, so Eric has spent 20 years studying Tibetan Buddhism, Asian medicine, Western herbalism and other forms of traditional knowledge. With an academic background in environmental history, religious studies and performing arts, his current research focuses on the critical intersection of ecology, mythology and health in a more than human world. <laughs> so it's super appropriate. <laughs> okay, so I'll hand over to Eric. Oh, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, really grateful to Jack and to the Sophia Center team for, for having me. I had a very similar experience um, because I had known uh, Greening the Supernatural and that book definitely influenced me pretty significantly. But then reading uh, this incredible ecology and spirituality book, uh, his introduction, it was it was a bit mind blowing for exactly the same reason. It felt like you know, there were lines that I read and I was like, that, I feel like I wrote that. <laughs> it's, it was such a strange uh, experience. <clears throat> but I think it really speaks to probably an experience that a lot of, of folks are having in a lot of different fields right now. You know, I'm I'm not someone to speak of these sort of like quantum shifts in a, a sort of willy nilly way, but I really do think that there is there's something happening just over the past five years, uh, definitely longer than that for a lot of folks. But I think a lot of people uh, have been sort of compelled into this field over the past five, 10 years uh, in a way that's really remarkable. And I keep seeing that in different places, often in very surprising places, uh, especially with folks who you know, their areas of research or specialization were very different from, you know, critical ecology or or dealing with the, the climate crisis, et cetera, who suddenly have felt drawn to direct their attentions towards that. Uh, and I definitely feel that for myself. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is, is unseen beings and the ecological crisis. Um, I really want to, you know, sort of drawing upon the, the theme of this course and on the ecology and spirituality book, uh, really showing that our ecological and climatic crisis or crises uh, are very much culturally and spiritually ingrained. Uh, our cultural ideas, especially our religious, spiritual and philosophical concepts have played a really key role, both in the causation of many aspects of these crises and also in our approaches to interpreting and responding to them. There's a bit of a tendency, I think, in modern environmentalism to kind of hand everything over to the earth scientists. Uh, we tend to think in our sort of modern scientific world that raw data alone is sufficient to comprehensively diagnose and treat everything that ails us. Uh, we're told to just trust the science, hand everything over, hand the reins over to the climatologists and they'll get it sorted. But we really need a much more robust collaboration between the sciences, humanities, and specifically the arts. Uh, if we want to be able to find a path through the so-called Anthropocene, which we'll be talking about a bit. Uh, historians and storytellers are every bit as essential to, uh, as climate scientists, for making sense of where we are, how we got here, and how to actually create change. Uh, we need to acknowledge in a really sober and clear-headed way the ways in which our cultural and spiritual values really set the terms of modern conversations about the environment, as well as the blind spots that they tend to create. Uh, there's always a risk, you know, even once we've disavowed a particular system or worldview to just sort of pendulate to the opposing position in a really reactive way without critically analyzing and deconstructing the underlying values that those systems have instilled within us. Uh, we see this a lot in religion in particular. People will leave one religion only to sort of repackage the exact same ways of existing in an opposing context with very little critical thought or deconstruction. 
Uh, this also happens, I think, with environmentalism. Eco-modernism sort of frames itself as a new path, you know, one in which we can use our, our great progressive human genius to save the world. Uh, but to reference uh, what I think is a very apropos myth that I'll be talking about a bit in this lecture, uh, we think that we can use the one ring for good. You know, <laughs> we, we miss the fact that the desire to dominate, even with a presumably noble intent, is itself a perilous path. We have no choice but to destroy the ring. We need to abandon the pursuit of dominion entirely, uh, motivated by a genuine sense of care and altruistic love. As, as, you know, <laughs> as um, cliche as that may sound. Um, just as a mini introduction to sort of myself and the, the sort of approach that I'm taking uh, over the past few years, uh, I've been increasingly drawn into the more than human world, and specifically the ways that humans conceptualize and relate to what we often term nature, uh, which is a term that I'll try to help us deconstruct a little bit. Uh, I've always been really passionate about non-human beings, especially animals from a, ver a very young age. Uh, that was one of the things that initially drew me deeper into things like Eastern spirituality, as well as philosophy, mythology, ethics, etc. Uh, my main background is in Tibetan Buddhism and in Tibetan studies, uh, including Tibetan medicine, which I, I did a classical education in between 2012 and 2016, uh, including extensive field work in Nepal. Uh, but in recent years, I've shifted more into academic work, especially in environmental history and critical ecology. The main area of focus uh, in my research is still largely Tibet and the Himalayas, uh, but I'm really more primarily interested in the evolution and transmission of ecological knowledge across space and time and societies and so on, uh, and this intersection between ecology, health, religion, and mythology in a more than human world. Uh, right now, most of my research is really centered on eco-daemonology or nature spirits uh, as a medium for sort of negotiating the intersections between humans and non-humans and other planetary agents. Uh, my practical experience as a Tibetan medicine practitioner uh, with traditional plant-based medicine, that was one of the things that really started to draw me deeper. Oh, oh sorry, I'm just going to mute. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things that, that drew me deeper into a relationship with plants in particular. Uh, what began as a very sort of extensive process of learning about all the medicinal properties of plants as healing tools uh, gradually grew into a curiosity about their lives and experiences as kinds of persons. Uh, this was itself one of the seeds of the book, uh, which is called Unseen Beings, but it takes a very broad definition of this idea of unseen beings. Unseen beings aren't always invisible. Uh, in fact, very often they're perfectly perceptible, tangible, even sometimes uh, physically imposing. In a lot of cases, we've simply learned to unsee certain kinds of beings as beings. They're unseen as a function of our disregard, uh, not as a function of their invisible nature. Of course, I am also very interested in unseen beings in a more conventional sense. Uh, you know, I specialize with Tibetan medicine, I specialize in provocation disorders or dunne uh, in Tibetan, which are diseases that are believed to be caused by non-human entities. Uh, in some cases, that really closely relates with epidemiology, microbiology, and virology specifically. Uh, but in other cases, it comes closer to paradigms of possession and spirit illness. Uh, but in all of these cases, in the Tibetan system and in a lot of traditional healing modalities and traditional ontologies as a whole, uh, these kinds of phenomena are very closely linked to human relations with the more than human world. Uh, another big influence on the book, uh, as far as its timing, I started writing it in, in 2020, uh, was COVID. Uh, I became really frustrated, increasingly frustrated, and I still find it frustrating, that most mainstream discussions surrounding COVID and other zoonotic infections uh, largely sidestepped their embeddedness in environmental processes. You know, people would say things like, oh, I wish people were as concerned about the environment and the environmental crisis as they are with epidemics. Uh, but in reality, these aren't entirely disconnected things. Uh, so this is one of the points that I touch on in the book and in one chapter in particular. In some ways, uh, and I'll get to the slideshow in just a second, in some ways, I, I feel... Uh, like I was a bit green to come into this kind of intellectual space 
uh, with this book when there are other scholars who've been working with this kind of material for decades. But to me, this is the point. We need a plethora of voices uh, coming from a diverse array of perspectives. And this was my attempt to sort of demonstrate uh, this kind of work from the vantage points that I knew best. Uh, you know, bringing in my experience with Buddhism and religion, uh, history, philosophy, plants, nature, spirits, mythology, etc., uh, to try and fill out the picture as best as I could. Um, Tolkien even makes his way into the book, who I'll talk about in a second, uh, which I felt really important to me because his work was really what first opened me up to an experience of natural enchantment. Uh, I always credit Tolkien uh, in everything that I do as being sort of my first guru of sorts, uh, because without him, uh, my life would have turned out very differently and unseen beings never would have uh, even arisen. Uh, I'll come back to him later in the lecture, but I just want to acknowledge his presence there. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and uh, go to the slideshow. Okay, so Unseen Beings and the Ecological Crisis. Uh, I I framed the book, I sort of structured the book uh, with what I uh, I sometimes call a, a clinical ecology. And uh, I take a, a fourfold sort of approach. There's four major sections of this book. And uh, it follows an old medical ontology, which has been used in traditional medical systems for thousands of years uh, and is still used today. And it, it's also found in some philosophical traditions, specifically in Buddhism. Uh, if folks are familiar at all with, you know, Buddhist sort of, uh, you know, philosophy, Buddhist uh, ideas, then you might be familiar with the Four Noble Truths, which are considered in some circles to be the original teachings of the Buddha, the first teaching that he gave uh, following his enlightenment. And what's often uh, ignored in, in that process is that his model for the Four Noble Truths was this medical model. Uh, it follows a diagnosis, that's the first noble truth of suffering, the etiology, the causes and conditions of that disease of suffering, which he identifies in most contexts as clinging or attachment desire, uh, though really in Buddhist philosophy, it's unawareness or ignorance. Uh, he talks about the prognosis, the third noble truth, what's going to happen, what, how, what is the end game of this disease, uh, is it curable? And then the fourth noble truth is his path of treatment, which uh, in the Buddhist context is the Noble Eightfold Path. And this model uh, was really sort of the skeleton of the book, how I decided to approach it. So I begin with, um, with a diagnosis, uh, and we'll talk about all of these sections in this lecture. But the diagnosis is quite complicated, as we'll see. Uh, in a nutshell, we can say that the diagnosis is that we have a very bad case of the Anthropocene. And we're going to deconstruct the concept of the Anthropocene in a minute, but that's uh, the sort of basic gist. We know our diagnosis. We know we know what we're facing. Uh, we're constantly confronted with the data to defend it and to demonstrate that we do have this disease and we need to deal with it. So that's one step. From there, we have to look at the etiology, especially if we take a more, quote unquote, holistic perspective, focusing on the root causes as opposed to just covering up symptoms. Uh, and the root cause in, uh, in this case, uh, I argue, is primarily anthropocentrism. Uh, anthropocentrism is a really key root cause in the cultivation of the Anthropocene. The prognosis, uh, what we're heading towards, is not good. It's a grim prognosis. The prognosis is quite negative. Uh, it is, in fact, apocalypse, which isn't necessarily terrible, given the fact that the disease itself is terrible. So an end to that through an apocalyptic process may be a kind of relief, but it's uh, it's quite complicated. We'll, we'll look at that. And then finally, treatment. Uh, how can we recover? How can we get through this? Uh, it's not quite as simple as taking a magic pill and all of a sudden everything is solved. Uh, it's a much more uh, complex process of recovery, uh, animistic recovery, I would argue, uh, really motivated and driven by an experience or process of reenchantment. Uh, the book has these nine chapters. Um, it talks about a lot. Uh, again, a lot of very similar topics to what Jack covers in uh, Ecology and Spirituality, 
Um, I talk about the diagnosis of the Anthropocene. Uh, I talk about uh, our, the second chapter of our, the natural state really dives more deeply into biology, especially some of the cutting edges of biology, fields like plant neurobiology, uh, which I find incredibly fascinating. The works of folks like um, Stefano Mancuso, uh, Suzanne Samard, Monica Gagliano, folks like that. Uh, really sort of upending some of the old stagnant ideas that we've had for quite a long time uh, about the nature of non-human beings and the lives of non-human beings. Uh, I thought it was important to put this in the beginning of the book or early on uh, before we get too deep into the, the sort of more corrupted ideas about these beings so that we can see them with fresh eyes. Uh, I talk about animism in uh, in the book, not as a part of our diagnosis or etiology, but instead an example of the natural state without disease. In Tibetan, we use this term tamel neme, uh, which is the natural state without disease. Uh, and it's important to understand what a healthy body looks like, what healthy functioning looks like, in order to be able to better understand when we've become imbalanced. So it's really dealing with that tension between balance and imbalance and recognizing uh, where the sort of initial starting points of our disease may have come in. Uh, I talk about philosophy and religion quite a bit in the book, especially in their Western context. I do also look at Buddhism specifically in the book. Uh, there's a chapter, a couple of chapters really dedicated to, to Buddhism and especially Tibetan traditions. Uh, but when we look at our etiology, when we look at the causes and conditions of the Anthropocene, we naturally have to focus a bit more on, on European traditions. Uh, so those are dealt with uh, at length. I talk about spirit illness, provocation, uh, and yeah, again, Buddhism mythology, uh, there's uh, the eighth chapter entering the perilous realm is primarily focused on the power of myth in order to influence the ways that we view the world and the ways that we engage with other beings. Uh, and the star character of that chapter is J.R.R. Tolkien. And the final chapter on treatment, methods of treatment, is structured based on the Buddha's eightfold path. So really looking at different ways that we can augment our modes of engagement with others, all others, human and non-human, as a, a path towards recovery, not towards treatment in its most sort of, uh, I guess, sort of grossest sense and its most uh, you know mundane sense, but recovery as a far more authentic path of treatment, uh, which again we'll talk to we'll talk about in a minute. So first, let's let's take a look at diagnosis, uh, because the diagnosis of our circumstances, of our, our crises, is obviously incredibly complicated. We know some of the key symptoms that we're experiencing. We know that we have a, a planetary fever that is ever worsening. Uh, we know that this is causing melting ice sheets and rising sea levels. Uh, we know that there are extreme weather events, uh, things like wildfires, but also storms that are increasing in prevalence all around the world uh, and reaching into places where they historically haven't occurred for at least a very long time. Uh, we know the aspects of species and biodiversity loss, which are distinct from, in many ways, uh, the sort of mainstream conversations about climate change proper. Uh, it's one of the reasons why simply referring to our crisis as global warming or climate change is quite reductive, because it tends to ignore a lot of the factors that aren't directly related to the weather and climate or uh, global warming specifically, but are nevertheless important factors in our planetary disease. Uh, the sixth mass extinction is uh, something that we need to take incredibly seriously. Uh, and even without the factors relating more directly to carbon emissions and, and global warming, it's something that deserves incredibly serious attention. Uh, habitat degradation as a whole is something that we should all be very concerned about. This is a major factor. Uh, soil depletion and erosion, as, uh, as Jack was talking about. Uh, pollution, including widespread radioactive contamination. That's a factor that's actually been used uh, to sort of buy climate scientists who are studying the Anthropocene to try and uh, gauge its starting point. I would argue that that's quite a reductive approach, but uh, if we use an empirical um, sort of basis, then it's understandable they would use that. All of these symptoms are pointing towards a, a fundamental diagnosis, but they themselves are just the symptoms. Uh, they give us an example of you know, where we're at and what the actual lived experience is of this disease, uh, but it doesn't really help us grapple with what the disease itself is. Uh, 
in an attempt to come to terms with our ecological crisis, there's a lot of complexity. We've had many different approaches to labeling our crisis. Um, we've had global warming, that was obviously incredibly popular as a sort of catch-all, uh, you know, um, identification of our crisis for many decades. Uh, this gradually shifted to climate change, partially because uh, a lot of folks, especially in the you know corporate sector and the private sector, considered uh, you know especially in the energy industrial complex, considered global warming to be a bit too apocalyptic sounding. Uh, climate change sounded a, a little bit friendlier, a little bit more approachable, uh, less terrifying. That was one of the reasons that it was then uh, sort of adopted as a more yeah, common uh, terminology to use. We have ecological crisis, which uh, helps us get out of the simple uh, sort of, you know, uh, weather and climate orientation uh, to look more at the impact that humans have had on non-human beings, on species, uh, biodiversity, etc. We have the environmental crisis, which has some issues because the basic concept of the environment can be a little bit reductive. An environment is a place uh, the environment in the ways that we talk about it is the stage on which human actors interact with one another and play out the grand drama of a human-centered world. Uh, we have our animal props and we have our plant scenery, uh, but those, these all exist in the environment as a place. In reality, the environment is not a place. <laughs> the environment is a community of countless different forms of beings, all of whom are actors in their own right. Uh, we, of course, then have this term Anthropocene, which we'll talk about directly in a minute. Uh, this is a useful term, I think, because it helps us get to the root cause. It helps us identify anthropocentrism as a really distinct factor in the cultivation of this epoch. However, it has a lot of limitations, namely in its uh, sort of centering of the anthropos as the chief driver of these changes that we're experiencing. While human-caused climate change is certainly the elephant in the room that we need to be dealing with, the concept that it's a human problem and in a very undifferentiated way, that it's all of humanity as a single whole, as a single species that's driving these changes is incredibly reductive and arguably very dangerous because it causes us to completely disregard the intricate social nuances, the political nuances that have always been at the helm of these most destructive uh, processes. And then, of course, we have this idea of, uh, of climate, the climate crisis, the climate emergency as a hyper object. And that is a very useful way to think about it because it's multifaceted. And it's not just multifaceted in, in the sense that we can take one issue at a time. They all are interconnected and interwoven. There are tentacular relations between all of these different symptoms and all of these different aspects of our crisis that we have to acknowledge as a whole in addition to uh, acknowledging them in the, as their independent parts. The standard Anthropocene narrative is something that has been debated a lot. Uh, it's been attacked from a lot of different perspectives, uh, especially in the social sciences, because of this tendency to collapse a very complex issue into a species-oriented problem. Um, I'll, I'll get into this in a minute, but the standard narrative is essentially, in a nutshell, uh, that we are experiencing an unprecedented and unintended crisis. Those are really important factors. It was unprecedented and it was unintentional. It was a shock. It was a surprise, something that caught us unawares. And it is empirically established. It can be established through empirical data, which is why we have people saying, oh, it started in you know, the 1700s because of the presence of certain kinds of molecules on a lake bed in Canada and so on. Um, and we think that it can be empirically established through geological data, because this is a geological epoch. Uh, that's what the Anthropocene technically is. And it requires a kind of what Deepesh Chakravarti calls a negative universal history, a universal history, which frames the human, the Anthropos, as a uniquely powerful and destructive species, which functions as an undifferentiated whole against the environment, against quote-unquote nature. 
Now, this is, a, again, a nutshell. There's more nuances to it than this, but these are this touches on some really important points. Chakrabarty goes on to say uh, that a critique of capital, even though Chakrabarty was uh, a he was a, a sort of Marxist social uh, theorist who who dealt really directly with the history of capitalism uh, and you know social theory etc. However, uh, in light of the Anthropocene, he argues that a critique of capital is not sufficient for addressing questions relating to human history once the crisis of climate change has be has begun to loom on the oh sorry has been acknowledged and the Anthropocene has begun to loom on the horizon of our present. I would argue that this is not true, as many others have argued, uh, but this really plays into the overarching story of the Anthropocene. We need to understand the Anthropocene as a narrative, and it's a very important narrative because it's a narrative that's attempting to contextualize our experience right now, our world right now, and the ways that we speak about it, the ways that we narrativize it are going to have long lasting ramifications in the futures that we create. So we have to be very sensitive and very careful about the ways that we conceptualize our crises and the so-called Anthropocene. Uh, because we may be led into some uh, dangerous paths. A lot of times when we talk about the Anthropocene, we'll uh, see graphs like these, uh, these so-called hockey stick graphs, uh, which have helped to demonstrate that there's been seemingly a very distinct, very direct correlation between certain Earth systems trends that we can see here on the, on the right, uh, and uh, human trends, sociological trends, uh, political trends, which have taken place on, on the left. Uh, specifically, you know, human energy use, fertilizer consumption, paper production, water use, uh, population, real GDP, um, telecommunications, transportation, etc. And all of these earth systems trends, uh, carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere, nitrous oxide, methane emissions, uh, stratospheric ozone, surface temperature, ocean acidification, all of this. And these graphs are intended to show that there was a particular point in our very recent history, uh, which is known as the Great Acceleration that began in the mid 20th century, where everything just started to spike. So humans started doing things, <laughs> we started acting in a particular way, and those human behaviors started causing undue disruptions to Earth systems and, uh, and leads, led us into this Anthropocenic uh, sort of hellscape. Now, these graphs unfortunately leave out a lot of very important details. Uh, for instance, which humans are we actually talking about here? Uh, and this is a fundamental question that we have to ask if we're going to call this epoch the Anthropocene. Which Anthropos are we referring to? Uh, there's a great book uh, by right here, Christophe Bonnet, uh, Bonnet and Jean-Baptiste Fasso called The Shock of the Anthropocene. This is an excellent book for really sort of problematizing and deconstructing the Anthropocene narrative. And they make the argument that this explanation that, you know, what's causing these problems? Humans, it's the Anthropos. This explanation, they say, might be sufficient for polar bears or orangutans seeking to understand which species was disturbing their habitat. And again, this would be orangutans and polar bears without much competence in so-called humanology, unable to discern the dominant males and asymmetries of power in the complex causal chain connecting the retreat of their habitat to human action. The human species geological action is the product of cultural, social, and historical processes. They go on to say, for instance, an average American consumes 32 times more resources and energy than an average Kenyan. A new human being born in the earth today will have a carbon footprint a thousand times greater if she is born into a rich family in a rich country than into a poor family in a poor country. And this relates to these this table that we can see on the right here, which is from a, a, a project from Jay Hickel from 2020, attempting to quantify national sort of geographic responsibility for especially carbon emissions uh, based on a more data-driven approach. So really looking at where the primary uh, players were in the uh, release of, of carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And based on this study, uh, about 40% of those emissions have historically come from the United States. 
a further 29% came from the EU, 13, which at this point still involved uh, the UK. The rest of Europe uh, was 13%, and the rest of the global north, 10%. This left only 8% of historical carbon emissions coming from the global south. The global south in this case doesn't refer to the southern hemisphere. This, revol this refers to the so-called global south, which includes places like India and China. The vast majority of human beings are parts of that tiny 8% at the bottom of the table. Nonetheless, they contributed a minute fraction historically of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions, which have contributed to global warming. This isn't to say that this will always be the case. Obviously, those are those uh, you know statistics are changing and evolving uh, every day. However, if we look at the historic responsibility for climate change, it's not all humans. It's not all of the entire Anthropos as this undifferentiated whole. It's very specific human societies that have contributed disproportionate amounts of carbon and also have contributed disproportionately to the terraforming of of the so-called neo-Europe's of environmental degradation, colonization, uh, you know, habitat destruction, et cetera. So we have to be nuanced about this. We can't actually fall into a, a negative universal history that collapses all of humanity into an anthropos, which can be treated as an undifferentiated whole. That attempts to do that are fundamentally depoliticizing narratives. It's an attempt to disregard, to do away with all of the intricate complexities, including critiques of capitalism specifically, and also processes of colonization, which are actually essential for understanding how we got ourselves into this situation in the first place. So, we need second opinions when it comes to our diagnosis. We need more than just this standard narrative driven by empirical data uh, focused primarily on geological data, which is how we've uh, framed the Anthropocene. It's what the Anthropocene is, but arguably that's not the best approach, or at least it's not the only approach that can be taken. Uh, we have this idea that climate scientists are responsible for leading the way into the future, but we need more critical and diverse perspectives especially from the humanities, especially those that take into consideration real social and historical processes uh, that have preceded our current epoch. Uh, climate scientists are essential. They can provide an assessment of our symptoms. They can help us stage our disease. Uh, they can help us understand our prognosis, but they are fundamentally not equipped to evaluate the complex historical and social causes, and arguably also to establish an effective method of treatment that is really going to make a, a significant difference. Um, you know, drug manufacturers need more than a knowledge of chemistry to, to create an effective medication. They also need real on-the-ground experience through clinical trials, etc. So there's a bunch of second opinions about what we could call our epoch and also the, the sort of disease that we're facing. Uh, some have argued that we should be calling it the Androcene, acknowledging uh, it, taking an eco-feminist approach, the specific role that misogyny and uh, male-dominated societies have had in the oppression of not only non-human beings, but also women and non-male beings, non-male humans throughout the, the course of history. Uh, so that's one approach that we could take. We could call it the capitalist scene. We could look specifically at the processes of instrumentalization, of you know, privatization and, and profiteering. We can look at the exploitation, exploitation of natural resources uh, through capitalism. And we could say, actually, that is a really key significant driving factor that better epi epitomizes the disease that we're facing. Uh, we could call it the petrol scene if we're really going to focus predominantly on fossil fuel emissions. We could call it the euro scene if we want to look at the very specific society societies that have historically had the gravest impact on the planet uh, through processes of colonization, etc. Um, obviously, we have Donna Haraway's Thulu scene, uh, which is really speaking to uh, the tentacular nature of these problems and also getting back into the earth. Uh, this is Chthonic in the sense that it gets into the earth, not necessarily Cthulhu in, in a Lovecraftian sense. Um, it's Chthonic in the sense that what's needed is a return to a more ecocentric mentality. Um, others have argued, and I, I think that this is a really important way to look at it, that the Anthropocene has not been an 
unexpected and unintended consequence of progress. It's been the goal all along. We have been in pursuit of what might be termed peak humanity. And this progressive move towards peak humanity, towards human domination, has taken many forms, and it has itself created quite a few apocalypses in the process. But now that we find ourselves in this position where we're no longer a mere species, but we're geological agents with absolute world-changing power, once we've reached that peak, what comes after it? <laughs> It's a drop. It's always going to be a drop. That's what a peak is. Uh, it's an apex and it's also the beginning of a decline. So we have arguably been in pursuit of this for a very long time. We've been going after the Anthropocene. This has been the project. And now that we find ourselves on the other side of it, we're starting to have some regrets. Um, a great uh, paper on this is Jill Schneiderman's The Anthropocene Controversy uh, in the book Anthropocene Feminism. It's a, a text that I, I highly recommend to get through sort of the controversy of the Anthropocene uh, and why this way of speaking about our issues might actually not be very helpful. For a more precise diagnosis, Bonnet and Faso argue that we need to be suspicious of grand narratives that present human interactions with Earth systems in this very generic sense. They say that, quote, this leads to historical explanations that are impoverished or erroneous, comforting the interests of a minority of the planet's population. On the contrary, the challenges of the Anthropocene, this is contrary to Deepesh Chakrabarty's idea that we need a negative universal history. They say, on the contrary, the challenges of the Anthropocene demand a differentiated view of humanity, not just for the sake of historical truth or to assess the responsibilities of the past, but also to pursue future policies that are more effective and more just. Um, to construct a common world in which ordinary people will not be blamed for everything, while the ecological crimes of the big corporations are left unpunished, in which the inhabitants of islands threatened by climate change will see their right to live on their territories recognized without their weak numbers condemning them to statistical and political non-existence. Um, I'll just... I, I'll, no, I'll say the end because I read through it. Anyway, a world in which the 30,000 people who still live as hunter-gatherers and are threatened with extinction by the year 2030 will continue to exist. The wealth of humanity and its capacity for future adaptation come from the diversity of its cultures, which are so many experiments in ways of worthily inhabiting the earth. So this is our, our diagnosis, and this is also beginning to speak to a, a certain sense of how we get through this, how, as, as Donna Haraway says, we make it through, we allow the Anthropocene to be as thin as possible. This is the goal. It's not to transform the Anthropocene into something benevolent, to use our great and mighty human power to double down on control. The goal needs to be to make this Anthropocene, this layer in the geological record, as thin as possible so that we can get through it into something uh, somewhat more holistic and ecocentric like a Thuleucene. So in order to understand how we got into this issue, we need to look uh, again in a very earnest and sober way at the etiology and pathogenesis of our disease. This is ultimately a big point of what Unseen Beings is really about. It's about how we forgot the world is more than human. And in order to understand that, we have to begin with an understanding of the natural state, this tamel neme, this balanced state without disease. I make the argument in the book based partially on historical and prehistorical evidence, uh, and also on a, ph a philosophical basis, that animism is our natural state. Um, this is sort of to Ying's point earlier, you know, saying that animism seems like something that's very foundational. This is something that is almost innate in our being. We don't have to teach children to relate to animals and potentially even plants and even inanimate objects like dolls and so on as alive. That's there. That We have to teach them not to believe that. We have to teach them, actually, plants aren't really alive, which isn't true, but we tell them that anyway. Or we might tell them, oh, well, you know, animals don't don't feel pain or you know we tell them all of these uh really destructive fairy fairy tales in the most pejorative sense in order to make being human in a human dominated world uh make more sense but animism is much more foundational 
this term animism, of course, has its roots in uh, E.B. Tyler's work from the, the 19th and early 20th century, father of anthropology, who coined this term as the primitive belief in spiritual beings. Uh, he perceived this as primarily a delusion, which led into the development of further delu delusions like religion. Uh, his view of animism was obviously uh, very pejorative. It was very colonial in its orientation, uh, based on this idea of sort of cultural supremacy in Western enlightened cultures uh, versus indigenous, uh, you know, more um, uh, primitive cultures, which still, you know, couldn't tell the difference between a person and a thing and so on. This view of animism has since uh, been completely done away with. We now have this new approach to animism, sometimes called new animism, which approaches it primarily as a paradigm of relationship. Uh, we can find this in the works of, you know, Graham Harvey, uh, who's written extensively on this, acknowledging that animists are really just people who recognize that the world is full of persons, very few of, of whom are human, and that life is really about living in relationship with one another. Uh, however, where Tyler did seem to be correct is in the fact that animism is phenomenally ancient. It is phenomenally prehistoric. Uh, evidence demonstrates that it, it seems to predate the existence or belief in gods, it predates ancestor veneration, it predates uh, beliefs in an afterlife, it is phenomenally innate, it's phenomenally prehistoric and primary, not as a delusion, but arguably, in fact, as the natural state from which we diverged in the creation of alternative models of uh, ontological paradigms. Graham Harvey says, as, as I, I mentioned a second ago, animists are people who recognize that the world is full of persons, only some of whom are human, and that life is always lived in relationship with, an, with others. Animism is lived out in various ways that are all about learning to act respectfully, i.e. carefully and constructively, towards and among other persons. There's another great quote, or he goes on to say, animism is more accurately understood as being concerned with learning how to be a good person in respectful relationships with other persons. Now, clearly, this it should go without saying this is not a religion. This is not a religious ideology. It's certainly not a distinct religious sort of um, worldview. Uh, there is no single version of animism. There are no tenets of animism. There are no prescribed rituals of animism. Animism is an ontology. It's a way of viewing and living in the world. From that foundation, many different things can arise, many different practices can arise, many different ethical paradigms can arise, but this is a foundational way of viewing and living in the world, which at some point, all of our ancestors were a part of. This was absolutely across the entire world. Everyone was an animist for the vast majority of human existence and arguably also before human existence and beyond human existence. Uh, I you know, made the argument that animals have to be animists by nature, by their, their sort of foundational mode of being in order to be in relationship with other kinds of animals and other kinds of beings. Uh, they have to presuppose that the other entities in their midst are also conscious, aware beings that are aware of their presence just as they are of theirs. Uh, this is essential in order to exist in a world of, of predators and prey. The presupposition of the awareness of others is uh, really essential for living in a living world. There's a, another great quote that I want to share from Bruno Latour, who unfortunately died um, fairly recently, uh, but a really brilliant quote that I think sort of uh, epitomizes some of the irony of a lot of the conversations that we have today. He says, animation, animation is the essential phenomenon and deanimation is the superficial, auxiliary, polemical, and often defensive phenomenon. One of the great enigmas of Western history is not that there are still people naive enough to believe in animism, but that many people still hold the rather naive belief in a supposedly deanimated material world. So from this, we have to then look at how we got sick. How did we go from this view, from this uh, potentially ostensibly balanced state of health, 
into a state of disease. And one of the foundational ideas that we have to deconstruct in this process is this very contrived divide between human culture and non-human nature. This notion of nature that we speak about often in very reverential terms, especially in environmentalist circles, is specifically a European philosophical construct. It has very little purchase outside of European cultural spheres. Most non-European languages have no word for what we call nature when we use that term to refer to that place out there full of non-human beings, that external dimension where there's animals and plants and all kinds of creatures that are separate from our human world. It's that separate domain, which is an, also an undifferentiated whole, much in the way that we often perceive humanity as an undifferentiated whole. This idea arose out of European philosophical notions, uh, ori originally in classical philosophy in the ancient Mediterranean, but really, our, its use in the context in which we now use it in modern times was really an Enlightenment uh, innovation. It wasn't something that was used in quite the same way before the Enlightenment era. There are, of course, different types of nature, speaking of the word nature specifically. We have specific natures, uh, so the nature of a thing. What is the nature of a pen? It is to write. Uh, what is the nature of uh, a phone? It is to do everything. Uh, you know, we have what is the nature of water? It is wet. That there's many terms for in many different cultural traditions. This is a common notion. Um, in Tibetan, we have rangshin, uh, which is the, the sort of self-nature, the nature of a thing. But that word rangshin does not refer to nature. It doesn't refer to that place that we think we go to on holiday or the place that we need to unite with or connect with or, uh, you know, have a friendlier relationship with. There's no such term. Uh, there's local natures, which is what we're talking about here, local natures in terms of places, localities, uh, a domain of non-human beings. And then, of course, we use this term natural also to refer to things that are innate or immutable, natural laws. Uh, we also refer to it in a number of other ways that uh, where things aren't necessarily innate, but they're just the way that we think they should be. Uh, there's a great book by Lorraine Dastin, um, Datsun, sorry, it's very, very short book. It's called Beyond, or sorry, Against Nature, very much worth reading. Uh, and she makes the point that, you know, for instance, arguments for nature have been used by all sides of virtually every debate uh, that we have in our world. Um, appeals to nature can be used to oppress queer people, and appeals to nature can be used to uh, defend the existence of queer people. This argument, trying to use nature as any sort of a valid basis for how something should be, is always really just erroneous, because this word doesn't have a lot of fundamental meaning. It's uh, filled with cultural connotation. We also tend to think of nature in the European context as a kind of machine, uh, specifically as a kind of clock. This was, uh, um, I think, Robert Boyle was his name. He was the one, uh, he saw the, the clock at Strasbourg Cathedral, and he was like, ah, this very complex machinery of all these intermoving parts and gears creating this beautiful clock, that's just like the natural world, as distinct from humanity. That's an important characteristic of this. The non-human natural world has been historically over the past at least few hundred years regarded as an inert machine-like thing, an undifferentiated whole created by the creator as a kind of clockwork, something that has no real uh, teleology, it has no intrinsic uh, self experience. There's no personhood. There's no subjective experience within it. It's just a bunch of gears functioning. Whereas humans are bequeathed with this rational human soul that separates us from nature and puts us into the domain of so-called culture. Uh, we, of course, also think of nature as a storehouse of resources, and this idea dominates a lot of environmental conversations where the main reason that we're told we need to worry about the environment is because otherwise we're going to run out of resources. We need to protect our resources. We need to save the Amazon because it's the so-called lungs of the earth, which that isn't how oxygen works. <laughs> the Amazon does not create the vast majority of the oxygen that we breathe. Uh, but also, this is a very anthropocentric perspective. We need to worry about the welfare of this vast collective of non-human and human beings because that's what gives me the oxygen to breathe. 
that sort of mentality is uh, is quite destructive and fundamentally instrumentalist, which is how the original sort of study of nature in Western Enlightenment traditions, economy, what, which is what it was originally called, or what we now call ecology, was born. Okay, so what is the pathogenesis of our disease? I would argue that the fundamental root cause of the Anthropocene is anthropocentrism. We'll talk about where that came from uh, in just a second. But as far as the pathogenesis of the Anthropocene, we've gone through a lot of different phases. If we look at it as a sequential sort of cumulative process of working our way towards peak humanity, we've gone through a lot of really distinct periods that have been a significant part of the Anthropocene. Um, any arguments for when the Anthropocene properly began are usually reductive. It certainly didn't begin in the great acceleration of the mid 20th century. It didn't arguably begin with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we have to at least acknowledge that because the Great Acceleration was based on the Industrial Revolution and the Industrial Revolution was based on colonization and the expansion of European empires into neo-Europe's and the exploitation of indigenous resources, etc., we have to at least go that far back. We have to at least go back to the, the 16th century uh, to look at where things really started getting serious. But we can go all the way back to the agricultural revolution, a fundamental shift in human relations with non-human beings. Uh, when we started domesticating animals and plants in earnest, we started creating uh, sort of human dominated spaces where we could control nature and non-human beings uh, and arguably uh, exploit them for our own ends. Um, there was of course urbanization, which partly grew out of this process. Um, in the book, I specifically talk about uh, the influences of classical philosophers, which we'll, we'll touch on in just a minute, um, especially Plato and Aristotle, in the sort of philosophical creation of anthropocentrism and the justification of anthropocentrism on the basis of our supposed possession of a rational human soul. Um, there was, of course, the influence of religion, Abrahamic religion in particular, which is uh, in some of its cases, especially in the case of Christianity and also to an extent in Islam, uh, highly anthropocentric. Uh, there was European colonization, which took a lot of these European movements, philosophical and religious, and pushed them across the world, shoved them down people's throats, and created a, a world that was really dominated by these ideologies. Uh, there was scientific modernism, including the modern study of ecology as the study of household resources, essentially. Um, there was, of course, the Industrial Revolution uh, and our modern capitalist uh, economy, a carbon-based capitalist economy, uh, as well as the Great Acceleration, which saw a massive uh, sort of explosion and arguably perfection of this very destructive system uh, in very modern times. So, the Anthropocene staging, the Anthropocene, or finding the golden spike, the point in, in the geological record in sort of, a, you know, a cliff face of, of various strata of, of different geological periods, that golden spike is very difficult to locate. We might think we can find it uh, geologically. We can see the actual point in the geological record where human influence started becoming very obvious. But in order to understand why that layer formed in the first place, we have to go much deeper into our history. Um, as Jack says in, in his book, we have removed woodlands, plowed up soils, built vast megacities from tarmac and concrete, and continue to burn coal, gas, and oil dredged up from beneath the Earth's surface, releasing vast qual quantities of carbon into the atmosphere in the process. Um, this is, a, I, I found this a really interesting quote because it's very similar to a quote that came 2,000 years earlier uh, from Pliny the Elder. Uh, who was a, a historian and, and a bit of a polymath who, uh, who died at Pompeii, actually. Uh, he wrote in the first century, quote, we search for riches deep within the bowels of the earth where the spirits of the death, dead have their abode, as though the part we walk upon is not sufficiently bountiful and productive. But what she has hidden and kept underground, those things that cannot be found immediately, destroy us and drive us to the depths. As a result, the mind boggles at the thought of the long-term effect of draining the Earth's resources and the full impact of greed. He wrote that 2,000 years ago. And I think comments like that really evidence the fact that this was in no way unforeseen. 
uh, as uh, as Bruno Latour says, we haven't lacked for warnings. The sirens have been blaring all along. We have long known that our relationships with non-human beings and environments and with so-called natural resources had a dark edge. And in many cases, we have overstepped our bounds and we've done things that we knew would have long reaching ramifications. There's another interesting quote from the Tibetan tradition from the, the father of Tibetan medicine who lived in the 12th century CE. Um, in the Tibetan tradition, I should just say humans provoke uh, or were seen to provoke the indignancy of unseen beings like Lu, Nyan, Nujin, Sadak, La, and Sin. These are all nature spirits in Tibetan Buddhism and in, in Tibetan culture um, who are believed to embody the living landscape. Uh, and we provoke them through ecologically destructive behaviors. Uh, this can cause things like illness, uh, it can cause uh, you know, environmental upset, it can cause climatic disasters and so on. And the, some of the specific uh, activities that he mentions as being particularly provocative include, quote, upturning the earth spirits by digging up turf and fields, disturbing water spirits by damming waterways and flooding meadows, cutting down tree spirits, literally just trees, uh, and uprooting stone spirits, performing wanton acts like burning impure substances, contaminating the hearth, and killing beings in sensitive places. He says that all of these are examples of human activities that upset the beings that inhabit the more than human world, the so-called natural world, which can then cause grave consequences for us and for our human societies. Now, there are some key figures that I think deserve a bit of heat for the cultivation of the anthropocentric worldviews that we live by and that have helped to create the Anthropocene that we're now living in. Um, I talk about a lot of these in the book specifically. Uh, Josiah is the oldest, chronologically speaking. Um, I won't get into his role too much right now, but he was really the, the chief systematizer of Abrahamic monotheism. Uh, he was really, historically speaking, primarily responsible for the reduction of deities in Abrahamic Jewish traditions from a multitude of deities, a multitude of gods into a single god, uh, which was expected to be worshipped in isolation, you know, independent of anyone else as this sort of, you know, mega god, this uh, overarching, you know, um, single deity that everyone should worship. Uh, though at this point, he was still a tribal god in, for all intents and purposes, relevant principally to Jewish people, uh, not necessarily to everyone around the world. That's a concept that hadn't yet evolved, uh, this notion of, of world religion in the way that we have it today. Um, but Josiah was important because I argue that monotheism has been a really key driver of this sort of depluralization of human life ways, of, of the variety of worldviews that we have historically always had, the nuances, the particularities of our kinds of relationships with our environments and other beings that was really collapsed uh, through the construction of a monotheistic world. Uh, I, I elaborate on this quite a bit in the book, so if you want more on that, then check it out. Um, there is, of course, also Plato and Aristotle in, uh, in the classical Greek world. It was really in their time that this idea of the rational human soul began to come into existence. Uh, they both wrote treatises on the soul, uh, and they both argued that there's basically a, a threefold uh, sort of manifestation of souls in the world. There's the vegetal soul that all beings, all biological beings have, animals, plants, humans, we all have it. And it's a basic soul that allows us to grow. And this fundamental soul doesn't have any subjective experience, is not conscious, does not survive death, does not go on to anything else after death. They are not aware. It's not a soul that provides any degree of individual subjective experience or awareness. It's just an animating force. The second soul is the animal soul, which all animals have, and humans also have this. And this is the soul that allows us to move around and to eat stuff and to reproduce. But it also has no subjective experience. There's no experience of awareness. There's no consciousness. It doesn't go on after death. It isn't intelligent. It's essentially just uh, automatic. It's, uh, it's this vitalizing force that dies with the body. And this is per their sort of theory why no animals or plants are sentient beings in any way, shape or form. They're just biological automata. 
The third soul, the rational human soul, is the unique thing that makes us different in their view from absolutely everyone else. It gives us the ability to think rationally, and it goes on after death. It is the only soul that's equipped with subjective experience. It's the only one that makes us moral agents and individuals whose experience should be taken into consideration in matters of ethics. Now, I should add that for both Plato and Aristotle, it wasn't purely anthropocentric. It wasn't all humans that by sort of, uh, you know, that all have this rational human soul. They both were quite ethnocentric and androcentric at the same time. They believed that it was principally the free men of Athens that had the rational human soul, while other kinds of humans, including in some cases women and children, as well as non-Athenian people, um, they weren't necessarily fully sentient in the same degree that uh, Athenian men were. So, but this model ultimately became uh, combined with uh, the sort of Abrahamic stream of anthropocentrism in the works of Paul, uh, who, again, I talk about him a lot in the book uh, as, well, not a lot, I talk about him a, a bit in the book as uh, the chief systematizer of Christianity. Paul wrote the, the letter, his letters before any of the gospels were written. Uh, he seems to have been the primary figure to sort of create Christianity in the way that we know it today. Not necessarily in the way we know it today, but in creating that trajectory, which has ended up uh, where we know it today. Uh, and part of his intent in that process was to disentangle uh, Judaism from its ethno-religious roots, to take it away from its tribal context as a religion to be practiced by a particular group of people, instead making it a world religion that everyone could be a part of, and indeed that everyone should be a part of. And that was a really important move, especially in the Hellenic world in which he was set, because the Hellenic world had already been primed by Aristotelian natural philosophy and the idea of the rational human soul and anthropocentrism on a philosophical basis. And when that merged with theological anthropocentrism, and then that was turned into a globalizing tradition that everyone could be a part of, this set us up for some, uh, some problems in the future. Uh, Thomas Aquinas was another figure who was very important in creating a, a systematic sort of um, syncretism between Christianity and Aristotelianism. Uh, when er some of Aristotle's lecture notes were back translated into European languages for the first time and people started engaging with them, folks like Aquinas tried to find ways to evidence the fact that early Europeans in the classical era were basically on their way to becoming Christianized already. They were already figuring things out. They were coming to some of the same conclusions. This was part of the argument. Um, Heinrich Kramer is another really interesting figure who I can't really get into because we're going to run out of time. Uh, but he's a big reason, uh, or he was a, a big figure in the development of the modern concept of the devil, uh, which I argue has a lot to do with some of the more unsavory processes that have associated nature and women with diabolism and evil. Uh, and that was a process that really came to a head in the witch trials, which were very largely driven uh, by the work famous work of Heinrich Kramer known as the Malleus Maleficarum. Uh, I, I, this gets into the intersection of religion and uh, some of the issues that we're talking about uh, and the really key role that perceptions of evil and the devil have played in some of these processes, uh, especially from the 15th, 16th centuries. Uh, Francis Bacon, uh, the, the father of empiricism, who famously said, uh, conquer and subdue nature with all her children, bind her to your service, and make her your slave. Uh, a great quote from the father of empiricism, uh, who really rejected any form of reverence towards nature as an impediment to the empire of man over the so-called inferior creatures of God, i.e. non-human beings. Uh, René Descartes was probably the most famous, more modern Enlightenment era Aristotelian who sought a, a, a firm synthesis between Aristotelianism, scientific rationalism, mathematics, and Christianity. Uh, and he also uh, really is a big part of the reason that many folks even today still believe that animals, non-human animals, are without sensory experience, that they don't feel pain, that they don't have internal lives. Uh, he sort of popularized that for a modern audience, famously even pinning up dogs to boards and dissecting them while they were still alive. Uh, in front of crowds in order to demonstrate 
how a, a biological machine goes in, sort of goes haywire when you take it apart. Uh, but he had to tell his audience not to worry because the dog doesn't have any subjective experience. It's just a machine, so it doesn't matter what you do to it. Uh, Carl Linnaeus, I don't really talk about in the book, but he's another important figure in uh, developing our sort of modern approach to ecology. Uh, he was the founder of our, our Latin binomial system where we name every species with, uh, with two Latin names. Uh, he was also the father of so-called scientific racism. Uh, he was the one that first posited that there are distinct races of humans and that they all have distinct stock characteristics. Uh, which then, of course, led to a justification of things like race-based slavery uh, in European colonies, especially in the Americas. So these are some key figures in uh, our process of forgetting that the world is more than human. They have gradually, in many different ways, philosophy, science, religion, spirituality, etc., they have gradually pulled us away from an acknowledgement of our natural state as living beings in a living world, replacing it with a fundamentally anthropocentric ideology that has taken us into the, the throes of our anthropocentric or anthropocenic disease. So now that we're here and we've made it through this trajectory, through this pathogenesis of this very serious uh, disorder, where are we left? What, what does the future hold for us? Uh, what's our prognosis? The prognosis, as I said, is negative. Uh, it's, it's not good. <laughs> Authentic recovery is possible, uh, at least for some, but it will require really significant interventions. And a big issue in this process is patient compliance. This is a big part of the reason why I personally am not optimistic about the future of our, our climate. Uh, we uh, we have to be compelled to take the treatment. If, even if a treatment is available and it could be a perfect cure that can absolutely fix things, if the patient is unwilling to actually take the medicine, then it's not going to do us any good. And unfortunately, with our current political and social climates, uh, with the long history that we're we're on the you know coming out of, I I don't really think that patient compliance is very likely to occur. So our prognosis is very much going to be negative. Uh, we may be able to get some palliative care. Um, this can provide a kind of lengthened, i.e., sustained lifespan. Come back to that in a second, uh, but it will certainly be marked by intense suffering. And this brings up a, a term that we tend to use a lot in these sorts of circles that I think needs to be, again, problematized to a certain extent, and this is sustainability. We have to ask ourselves, what is it that we're trying to sustain? What is, when we talk about sustainability, what is it that we're really hoping to sustain? And the, the truth tends to be that we want to sustain this, the, the status quo, the systems that we currently have, systems which have historically been based on exploitation, that have been based on the, uh, you know, the oppression of those that are outside of the so-called master identity, whatever we use to determine that, whether we use species or race or sex or gender or religion or ethnicity or what have you, uh, that system is what we're trying to sustain. Uh, specifically, you know, in its most obvious sort of environmental form, we're trying to sustain models of natural exploitation, the exploitation of natural resources. We want to allow that process to go on for as long as possible with minimal interruptions. And that is really, uh, at the end of the day, a big part of what our goal is when we discuss sustainability. That is worrisome. What we're heading towards is certainly apocalypse. Uh, and this is something that we should look at with uh, a, an open mind, I would say. There's an eco-theologian, Catherine Keller, who talks about apocalypse as a project, as something that we've actually been, been sort of cultivating, much like the Anthropocene, for a very long time. Uh, it should come as no surprise that the most dominant religion in the world for thousands of years is an apocalyptic religion. It arose out of Jewish apocalypticism, which were sort of fringe movements uh, around the, the first century BCE and going into the early centuries of the Common Era. And it was the most successful form of that. It is an apocalyptic tradition. Uh, there's nothing new about the notion of apocalypse. It's really more ancestral than it is imminent. Uh, and there might be something about this script that really compels the Christian West to repeatedly enact it 
to repeatedly create apocalypses and to push us towards apocalypse. Uh, you can see this today. A lot of rhetoric, especially amongst the Christian right in places like America, uh, surrounding the, the conflict in the Middle East and the destruction of Gaza, this uh, is being narrativized today by many people as the, the beginning of the end times. This is the sign. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to establish his heavenly kingdom on earth. It's very concerning that we are working towards apocalypse uh, in this very active way. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that apocalypse is in fact proceeding. Uh, we need, according to Catherine Keller, a kind of counter apocalypse, which doesn't reject the reality of apocalypse, but rather seeks to reframe it as an opportunity for decomposition, for transformation, and for new possibility. It's also worth noting that apocalypses have been happening for a very long time. Anthropocenes have been happening for a very long time. Um, Catherine Yusuf argues that we need to acknowledge either a billion Black Anthropocenes or none. Because from the perspectives of the countless indigenous peoples and non-European peoples whose entire lives have been completely destroyed, whose cultures have been destroyed, who have been subjected to genocides in a, a physical manner and also in cultural manners, though their experiences were apocalyptic. For the 50 million Native American peoples that were killed during just the first hundred years of European colonization of the Americas, that was an apocalypse. That was nothing short of an apocalypse. This isn't an impending future possibility. This is something that we have repeatedly enacted in our pursuit of so-called peak humanity over at least the past 500 years. There is, uh, Yusuf says, quote, there is a need to question moves to innocence, the claim that we failed to understand the violent repercussions of colonization, industrialization, or capitalist modes of production, and that these violences were an unforeseen byproduct or excess of these practices and, uh, and not a central tenet of them. So the prognosis is apocalypse, but apocalypse, the end of one world, is not necessarily the ending of all worlds. And one could make the argument that the best thing that could happen to our exploitative, capitalist, instrumentalist world that we've constructed is indeed for it to crumble and fall. But what we need to be focusing on, arguably, is not trying to sustain that castle and keep it from crumbling. It's not to reinforce it and tie metal grid, you know, grid, uh, gridding around it or, you know, like uh, um, barriers around it to make sure that it stays in, intact. What we need to do is allow for new growth to grow from the cracks of that crumbling world, to create little pockets of sanity, pockets of other ways of being and living in relationship with the the more than human world uh, as we go into our future. And that's something that all of us can do every single day in our own lives, in our own fields of research, in our own areas of, of you know, our societies and the places that we work. This is the kind of work that we can all be doing. We can all escape in our own individual ways from the ontological shackles of exploitation and instrumentalism and anthropocentrism, and we can create other ways of being, other worlds that we can live in. And we need to create many of them. We can't simply replace one giant castle of exploitation with a new, slightly more stylish and slightly uh, better functioning version of that. We need pluralism. We need a diversity of voices, a diversity of worldviews, a diversity of relationships between humans and non-human beings in a highly pluralistic world. So this, of course, brings us to our, our treatment. And before we look at treatment, we have to address the failed therapies that we've attempted so far. There's, of course, eco-modernism or uh, neo-environmentalism, uh, which, you know, suggests that we uh, we simply... Oh, yeah, no, no, this is right. Uh, Eco-modernism, neo-environmentalism, which uh, suggests that we can use our human ingenuity to come up with techno fixes uh, and we can, you know, control everything more solidly and more stably, double down on our control in order to make things run more smoothly. This is, is not going to work. It has not worked. Uh, and this progressive mindset is, in fact, directly what motivated processes like European colonization. From a European perspective, going into indigenous lands 
massacring indigenous peoples, destroying indigenous lifeways, changing indigenous climates, getting rid of uh, indigenous animals and plants and replacing them with European alternatives. That was progress. Getting rid of untamed wilderness or what they thought was untamed wilderness and replacing it with neat and tidy gardens and farms was progress. This was, from the perspective of the colonists themselves, a progressive move towards a more sensible uh, human-dominated world. The, the perfection of the human empire that God has bequeathed uh, must be the case. So we have to question this uh, constant progression towards peak humanity because there's a fall. Uh, of course, individual responsibility has been another failed therapy. This uh, idea of the, you know, your our personal individual carbon footprint as the main thing that we need to focus on. That was a PR stunt by British Petroleum to get people to focus less on the, you know, fossil fuel industry and more on all of our individual behaviors that are helping to destroy the planet. So if we all just recycle and drive electric cars and, uh, you know, uh, change our diets, then we'll be able to save the planet. This isn't effective and it's also not really Really getting to the root cause. There's also stewardship, this idea of stewardship and the greening of religion. And this comes to uh, a couple of really important points, one of which um, uh, Jack makes in his book, uh, which is a quote from Timothy Morton, where he says, uh, regarding Christianity, he says, quote, with its apocalyptic visions and thousand year itches, Christianity isn't ready for hyper objects. Yet thinking about these materials does involve something like religion, because they transcend our personal death. Hyperobjects will outlast us. I would also uh, point to a quote from Lynn White Jr. regarding Christianity. He says, quote, especially in its Western form, Christianity is the most anthropocentric religion the world has seen. Man shares in great measure God's transcendence of nature. Christianity, in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and Asia's religions, except perhaps Zoroastrianism, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his proper ends. With this in mind, an attempt to greenify Christianity and highlight stewardship, environmental stewardship, from the, the superior humans is arguably quite faulty. That's not going to get to the root cause. That's just going to put lipstick on a pig and make it seem a little bit more attractive and sustainable, but it's just greenwashing. That's not really getting to the root issue. Um, humanism and sustainability, we talked about that a bit. I would also argue, and I, I know that Jack would agree with this, that supernaturalism is also potentially a bit dangerous. Um, and I'll justify that in saying that supernaturalism in the sense that Western societies, having been told by scientists that nature is disenchanted, developed an alternative dimension in which magic and enchantment can exist that is disconnected from the physical world. Supernaturalism is essentially the idea that magic and uh, mystery and spiritual meaning and, uh, you know, the mind and all of these wondrous things exist in a, a sort of domain that is separate from the physical world. It's transcendentalist. It's not imminentist. It doesn't bring us back into the earth or even into our bodies. It separates us from them. And that's quite dangerous. This is why I love this idea of greening uh, the supernatural, of taking a lot of the same ideas, a lot of the same motifs and experiences, everything from ghosts and spirits to, you know, uh, UAPs or UFOs or whatever we're calling them, uh, and allowing that to be something that's much more naturalistic, that may be more connected with nature spirits, with, you know, the other beings that we share our planet with than it does with extraterrestrial humanoids that are obsessed with humans. Uh, so that's a, another important consideration. I'm going to skip through this, I think, because I want to get to the essential therapeutic principles. But basically, Nietzsche says we get the morals that we deserve based on the values that we already live by. And this is an important thing to consider, actually, because if we want to change, if we want to create real, lasting, significant change in our societies, we can't just focus on creating new moral frameworks, because our morals naturally arise from the values that we already hold, which naturally arise from the ways in which we live. If we want to change our ways of living in the world, we have to actually experiment with other ways of existing, other kinds of practices. We need to begin by challenging the ways that we live and the stories that we tell. That's the only way that we can ultimately impact our behaviors on a, on a more sort of uh, macro uh, scale.
we need new slash old stories and new experimentations in what it means to be human. That's really essential. So some essential therapeutic principles uh, I argue in the book. One is that our treatment needs to address the root causes, not just manage symptoms. I would argue, and I stand by this, if tomorrow morning we were to wake up and someone had discovered an endless source of clean, renewable energy, our problems would still not be solved. In fact, they might even become worse, because if we use that clean source of limitless energy to become more efficient in our wholesale destruction of non-human beings and their environments, in the, the exploitation of so-called natural resources, then that's just going to speed up our apocalypse. We may be able to limit some of the effects of global warming, which is absolutely necessary, but it's not getting to the root cause. We also need to go beyond this idea of the sustained or future welfare of humans as the primary concern. We need to learn to really care about the welfare of non-human beings and environments, not because of us, not because sustaining them will help us have more resources. We need to learn to care for their welfare first and foremost. And we need to acknowledge differentiated social histories and socio-cultural dynamics, not re reducing everything to a negative universal history like Chakrabarty suggests. I argue that animism needs to be a foundational framework of our recovery. We need to acknowledge the beingness, the mindedness, the selfhood, the personhood of non-human beings. And we have to do that immediately. We need to do it with animals. We need to do it with plants, fungi, microbes. I argue that we need to do it with viruses. And we need to open up to the possibility of nature spirits as a model for negotiating our interactions with supposedly non-biological phenomena like mountains and rivers and oceans and the atmosphere itself. We also need to take indigenous forms of traditional ecological knowledge seriously as forms of knowledge, not as cultural traditions, not as, you know, just a sort of cultural relic like circle dancing or something like that. That's not what traditional ecological knowledge is. It's knowledge. It needs to be at the table. Indigenous peoples need to be at the table. Their knowledge systems need to be considered as genuine sources of information and wisdom and insight into the nature of our world. World. We need re-enchantment as a therapeutic process, and this is really essential, and we need recovery as our goal. Not healing the earth, not saving the earth, not doubling down on domination to control things more efficiently. We need to recover a sense of what it means to be human in a more than human world. Now, these are the last two slides and then I'm done. Sorry for taking so long. I'm not a succinct person in case you haven't uh, been able to tell. Um, I argue that stories, mythology, are absolutely essential for making our way through the Anthropocene and ensuring that it is as thin and short as possible. And I want to share a couple of quotes from who I mentioned early on, J.R.R. Tolkien, who was someone whose work, in my opinion, really epitomizes the, the magic and wonder that can arise from an experience of natural enchantment. His mythology is robust, it's powerful, it's uh, authentic, I think, in a really profound way, and it's perfectly situated for the world in which we're living. Uh, but I want to share a quote from his essay on fairy stories, in which he explains the role and function of fairy stories and myths in human societies and human experiences. Um, actually, sorry, this, this comes from another essay. This is from his essay on Smith of Wooten Major, which was one of the last works he composed and published in his lifetime. Uh, and this is an essay that he has uh, accompanying this. Really beautiful quote. He says, Fairy, fairy, which according to Tolkien is not just a fairy, but the dimension or domain of enchantment in which fairies have their being. It's not just some supernatural abode that's separate from the earth. It's an enchanted way of experiencing our own living world, in which certainly you may find elves and dwarves and, and fairies and hobbits and what have you, but you'll also find trees and oceans and lakes and the sun and the sky and the ground and all of the beings that inhabit our world if we're in a state of enchantment. Tolkien says, quote, fairy represents at its weakest a breaking out, at least in mind, from the iron ring of the familiar. Still more from the adamantine ring of belief that it, i.e. the familiar, is known, possessed, controlled, and so ultimately all that is worth being considered, a constant awareness of a world beyond these rings. He says more strongly 
it represents love. That is a love and respect for all things, inanimate and animate, an unpossessive love of them as other. This love will produce both Ruth and delight, Ruth being the opposite of ruthlessness. Things seen in this light will be respected, and they will also appear delightful, beautiful, wonderful, even glorious. This compound, and this is the, the key point, this compound of awareness of a limitless world outside our domestic parish, a love in Ruth and admiration for the things in it, and i.e. the beings in it, and a desire for wonder, marvels, both perceived and conceived. This feity is as necessary for the health and complete functioning of the human as is sunlight for physical life. I'll share one final quote from Tolkien, and I'm actually going to let an AI version of him read it because it's better in something approximating his own voice uh, with some film that I, I pulled together. It's just a couple of minutes and then we'll be done. Again, sorry about um, taking so long. Uh, but this is, I, I think, a really important statement on recovery. I use this term recovery in place of saving the planet or treatment, or fixing things, or, you know, solving the Anthropocene, solving the climate crisis, because that is just insinuating that the role of the human is to double down, control, and fix things. What we really need is to pull back. We need to pull back from our desire to dominate, pull back from our desire to control. We need to recover, and I'll let Tolkien explain what recovery really um, consists of. And give me a thumbs up if you can hear this once I start playing it, just so I know. One sec. Recovery, which includes return and renewal of health, is a regaining, regaining of a clear view. I do not say seeing things as they are and involve myself with the philosophers, though I might venture to say seeing things as we are or were meant to see them as things apart from ourselves. We need in any case to clean our windows so that the things seen clearly may be freed from the drab blur of triteness or familiarity, from possessiveness. Of all faces, those of our familiars are the ones both most difficult to play fantastic tricks with, and most difficult really to see with fresh attention, perceiving their likeness and unlikeness, that they are faces and yet unique faces. This triteness is really the penalty of appropriation. The things that are trite or in a bad sense familiar are the things that we have appropriated legally or mentally. We say we know them. They have become like the things which once attracted us by their glitter or their color or their shape. And we laid hands on them and then locked them in our board, acquired them, and acquiring ceased to look at them. Creative fantasy, because it is mainly trying to do something else, make something new, may open your hoard and let all the locked things fly away like cage birds. The gems all turn into flowers or flames, and you will be warned that all you had or knew was dangerous and potent, not really effectively chained, free and wild, no more yours than they were you. The fantastic elements in verse and prose of other kinds, even when only decorative or occasional, help in this release. But not so thoroughly as a fairy story, a thing built on or about fantasy, of which fantasy is the core. Fantasy is made out of the primary world, but a good craftsman loves his material, and has a knowledge and feeling for clay, stone, and wood, which only the art of making can give. By the forging of Graham, cold iron was revealed. By the making of Pegasus, horses were ennobled. In the trees of the sun and moon root and stock, flower and fruit are manifested in glory. And actually, fairy stories deal largely, or the better ones mainly, with simple or fundamental things untouched by fantasy. But these simplicities are made all the more luminous by their setting. For the storymaker who allows himself to be free with nature can be her lover, not her slave. It was in fairy stories that I first divined the potency of the words and the wonder of the things, such as stone and wood and iron, tree and grass, house and fire, bread and wine. <laughs> 